I know not what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And I want to tell you, I've been guided by the light of God's grace my entire life. People ask, what's the secret to my success? It's because I lean into his grace. Because life is always talking to us. And this is what I do know. When you tap into what it's trying to tell you, when you can get yourself quiet enough to listen, I mean, really listen, you can begin to distill the still small voice, which is always representing the truth of you from the noise of the world. And you can start to recognize when it comes your way. You can learn to make distinctions, to connect, to dig a little deeper. You'll be able to find your own voice within the still small voice. You'll begin to know your own heart and figure out what matters most when you can listen to the still small voice. Every right move I've made has come from listening deeply and following that still small voice aligning myself with its power, with the source of power, so that when I walk into a room just as cool as you please, and the fellas either stand or fall down on their knees, and they say, that's a phenomenal woman. And when I walk into that room, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. Because everybody that's ever come before me walks into that room with me. My great-great-grandfather, Constantine Winfrey, born an enslaved man and couldn't write or spell his his name, but 10 years after the Emancipation Proclamation had learned to read and had picked 10,000 bales of cotton in exchange for 80 acres of land and became the first person in my American lineage to own his own property. I come as one, I stand as 10,000, has been my mantra for power. Because for so many of my earlier years, when I was the only, I was the only woman, I was the only person of color, the one nobody expected to be in the room, at the table, on the anchor desk, co-anchoring the news here in Nashville in 1975, walking into boardrooms in the 80s, negotiating deals to own my own show not just do the show, but to make as much money from it as they were going to make off of me. And at no time did I ever feel out of place or not enough or inadequate or an imposter. Do not let the world make an imposter syndrome out of you. Why? Because I knew who I was. And more importantly, I knew whose I was. I didn't know the future, but I knew who was in charge of the future. And my job, just as your job is, to align with God's dream for you. And my prayer was always, use use me, God. Show me how and who you need me to be. Because this is what I will tell you. God can dream a bigger dream for you than you could ever imagine for yourself. I am living testimony of aligning and living history. But my job today is to help you to commence to the next part of your dream odyssey. So let's talk about the right moves for that. I've been thinking a lot about how much of your lives have already been spent grappling with the extreme complex complex issues of our time because you are the generation that is forced to depend on body cams to obtain justice. And even then, accountability, as we've seen again and again, can be so hard to come by. You witnessed the storming of the Capitol and the death of civility. You are acutely aware that voting rights are being gutted, women's rights are being dismantled, books are being banned, history is being rewritten, the Supreme Court is being corrupted, the debt ceiling is being held hostage, the climate is changing, the LGBTQ community, LGBT plus community is under attack, the Cold War is back, the leaders are behaving like children, the children are being gunned down by military-grade assault rifles. We live on a planet where there is more than enough wrong to keep you busy trying to make things right for the rest of your natural life. And unfortunately, you're going to encounter people who will insist that it's not actually possible to make any real difference. But I believe 
Tennessee has a couple of Justins, just a few miles from here, who would respectfully disagree. Representatives like Justin Jones and Justin J. Pearson are using their lives to prove the cynics wrong, and they're building on the legacy of giants, mentors of mine like John Lewis, whose fight for justice started right here in Nashville, and who now speaks to us from eternity. Well, this is what I know for sure. There will never be anything in your life as fulfilling as making a difference in somebody else's. Everybody here wants to see you take your integrity, your curiosity, your creativity, your guts, and this newfound education of yours, and use it to make a difference. Everybody always thinks you gotta go do something big and grand. I'll tell you where you start. You start by being good to at least one other person every single day. Just start there. That's how you begin to change the world, by just being good to one other person. It doesn't matter if it's a member of your tribe or a stranger on the street. I'm here to tell you that a little act of compassion can be a lifesaver for somebody who receives it, but also for you who offers it. Just extend yourself in love and kindness to somebody. And as my dear friend Maya always said, love recognizes no barriers. It jumps hurdles, it leaps fences, it penetrates walls to arrive at its destination full of hope. And when you step out in love, you become someone's hope. And I know that becoming hope in the world won't always be easy. There'll be times when you get to your wit's end, but there's another old proverb that says, when you get to your wit's end, remember that's where God lives. I would add that when you get to your wit's end, it's also a good idea to remember that you've been there before because we are among the toughest, most resilient people the world has ever seen. And I'm just not talking about older generations, your generation has masked up and locked down for a pandemic that ravaged the world. You, my TSU friends, have trained for complicated times. And I don't care how hard life after college gets, and it's gonna get hard. We need you to dream big. We need audacious thinkers. Use my example. I was one good TSU teacher, Mr. Cox, and one timely phone call away from a career that would absolutely change my life. That story's not just my own. What dream are you one or two steps away from? We also need generosity of spirit. We need high standards and open minds and untamed imagination. That's how you make a difference in the world, using who you are and what you stand for to make changes big and small. And there will be times when making the next right decision will be scary. I'd tell you a secret, that's how I've gotten through every challenge without being overwhelmed, by asking, what is the next right move? You don't have to know all the right moves. You just need to know the next one. And it's okay to be scared. In fact, if you weren't scared, I'd be scared for you. But let me repeat something that the most extraordinary, certainly one of the most extraordinary men I've ever known said, may your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. Let your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. To me, that's a nine word prayer. And it came from a single individual who literally changed the world by putting his own fears aside for the people of his country. Thank you, Nelson Mandela. Now you all have photos to bomb and diplomas to frame, heels to change out of, I don't know how you walk in them heels, Trinity, neckties to hand to your next of kin, but I can't just tell you what desperate shape the universe is in and send you on your way, so I'm going to leave you with this instead. The world is weaning itself off Russian fuel. Electric cars are going mainstream across the globe. That hole we punched in the ozone layer is healing. Ukraine is still in there fighting for us all. Finland joined NATO. COVID is currently receding and there are human beings who very quietly donate their bone marrow to strangers. And this to me signals that the United States of America may not be united, but we are not a finished product. My point is, Anything is possible. The wheels are still in spin. Saints walk among us. And as Nelson Mandela so brilliantly demonstrated, 
it's better to be hopeful than fearful, if for no other reason than the fact that hope brings us one step closer to joy. And I leave you with this. You have been prayed for and paid for, not just tuition, but paid for through the sacrifices, through the daily aggressions, through the discriminations, the locked doors, the back doors, the barriers broken down, through the humiliations, working two and three jobs, just trying to make ends meet and get you a little money so you can have something to spend in college. Every family member from generations who help make this day possible, you owe them a rising. And your job is to come on up to the rising, to meet the rising of your life. I'm here to tell you that you actually do get to transform the world every day by your actions. Small steps lead to big accomplishments. And I'm here to tell you that your life isn't some big break like everybody thinks it is. They're waiting on the big break. It's actually about taking one significant life transforming step at a time. So you can pick a problem, literally any problem. The list is long because there's gun violence and economic inequality and there's media bias and the homeless need opportunity and the addicted need treatment and the dreamers need protection. The prison system needs to be reformed. The social safety net needs saving. Misogyny needs to stop. And the truth is, you cannot fix everything. But what you can do here and now is make a decision. Because life is about decisions. And the decision is that you will use your life in service you will be in service to life and you will speak up, you will show up, you will stand up, you will sit in, you will volunteer, you will vote, you will shout out, you will help, you will lend a hand, you will offer your talent and your kindness however you can and you will radically transform whatever moment you're in. Which leads to bigger moments because the truth is Success is, it's, it's a process. You can ask anybody who's been successful. And so service is not just about when you're getting served. It's truly everything. You know, I started my talk show. I was just so happy to be on television. And I was one day interviewing members of the Ku Klux Klan. I thought I was interviewing them so that I could expose their vitriol to the world. I saw them giving signals to each other in the audience and I thought, hey, something's going on here. And I realized they were using me, they were using the platform for themselves. So I said to my producers afterwards, I'm not going to do that anymore. Then we did a show where someone was embarrassed and it was my fault. I was responsible for the embarrassment. For some crazy reason, we talked to a man who was cheating on his wife to come to the show with the woman he was cheating on and his wife. And he said yes. And while there on live television, he says to his wife that his girlfriend is pregnant. That happened on my watch. And when that happened, shortly after I'd interviewed the Klan and experienced that, I said, I'm not going to do that again. So I started to ask the question, how can I use this show to not just be a show, but to allow it to be a service to the viewer? And that question of how do we serve the viewer transformed the show. And because we asked that question every single day from 1989 forward, with the intention of only doing what was in service to the people who were watching. It is why no matter where I go in the world, on any given day, somebody comes up to me and says, I watched your show. It changed my life. I've been watching since I was five years old until I went from DVR to, <laughs> to VCRs to now streaming. People watched 
and were raised by that show. I did a good job of raising a lot of people, I must say. And that happened because of an intention to be of service. So I live in this space of radical love and gratitude. Truly, I have, I, I, I feel, the most beautiful life that you can imagine. I sit around trying to think of who could have a better life. And I will tell you, whatever you imagine my life to be like, I wonder what Oprah's doing right now. It's always 10 times better than whatever you think. It's true. And it's because, not because I have wealth, which is great. It's, with money's fabulous. I love it. And I get a lot of attention, and that's also good, sometimes. But it's because I had appreciation for the small steps, the seeds that were planted, the map and flow of my life that unfolded because I was paying attention. You have to pay attention to your life because it is speaking to you all the time. And the bumps in the road and the failures that pointed me in a new, dire new direction and led me to a path made clear. That is what I'm wishing for you today, your own path made clear. And I know that there is a lot of anxiety, a lot about what the future holds and how much money you're going to make. But your anxiety does not contribute one iota to your progress, I'm here to tell you. It does the opposite. Look at how many times you worried and you were upset and you didn't think you were going to make it through the block. I got that text a couple months ago. And here you are today. You made it. And I'm here to tell you that you're going to be more than okay. So take a deep breath with me right now. And repeat this. Everything is always working out for me. I want to hear it. Everything is always working out for me. That's my mantra. Make it yours. Everything is always working out for me because it is and it has and it will continue to be as you forge and discover your own path. But first, you do need a job. Yep, you need a job. And may I say, it does not have to be your life's mission, not your greatest passion, not your most fulfilled self, but a job that pays your rent. Yes, and lets you move out of your parents' house. Look who's applauding. Because yes, they are tired of taking care of you and are hoping that this CC fine education you received is going to pay off. And it will, it will, I promise you, in ways that today you cannot even imagine. You know, for years I've been talking about, and I've done a lot of graduations, and I do a lot of lecturing, talking at the table, exchanges with the girls, and we talk about passion and purpose and realizing your dream. And uh, I realized that I was confusing them uh, and their expectations were out of whack. One of my daughter girls who graduated two years ago came out of school with a job that she'd previously interned. She bought her own used car, has an apartment she shares with one, only one roommate, all with no help from me. And she'd only been working about six months, calls me and says, Mama, they want to give me a promotion. But I don't think I want the promotion because I don't think it fulfills my purpose. And I said, your purpose right now is to keep that job. Your purpose is to do what you have to do until you can do what you want to do. I borrowed that line from the great debaters. So here's the truth. For years, I had a job. And through that job, doing a lot of things that I actually didn't want to do, I got demoted and discovered my life's calling. So I was on the air as a reporter. My job ended when I was 28 years old, but I'd been working in radio, got my first job in radio at 16, was hired in television at 19. And it was a job because every day I felt like, I don't know if this is really what I'm supposed to be doing. But my father was like, you better keep that job. So when I was 28, it wasn't working out for me on the news because I was too emotional. 
I'd go to cover stories and cry because people lost their houses or lost their children. I was told that I was going to be taken off the evening news and put on a talk show. That was a demotion for me at the time that actually worked out for me. So I would like to say that many times, many times there are things that look like failure in your life. And I want to clear up because for years at every graduation, I've said, there's no such thing as failure. Well, it is. I've said it's no such thing as failure. It's just life pointing you into a different direction. It does, it indeed does. But in the moment when you fail, it really feels bad. And it's embarrassing and it's bad. And it's going to happen to you if you keep living. But I guarantee you, it also will pass and you will be fine. Why? Because everything is always working out for you. So I realized this when I was in the struggle of my life. I tried to build a network at the same time I was still trying to do a show. And I did not have the right leadership. Everything is about having people in the right positions to support you. And so I had to take a good long look at myself when everything in the media, because all of my mistakes are on the evening news or the CNN crawl, I can't do anything privately. So in every news story, when every story is about struggle, 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 I had to have a talk with myself and say, what is this really about? What is this here to show you? My favorite question when in crisis, what is this here to teach or show me? Jeff Weiner, one of my friends and founder of LinkedIn, says that failure is what's going to humble you. It helps you realize how fleeting success can be, at least traditional measures of, of success, because you realize that to some extent, how it is just beyond your control and you invest less in it in terms of the way you define yourself. Success in terms of achieving objectives, in terms of manifesting a mission, in terms of manifesting a vision, that's all good, especially if what you do can create good in the world. But to the extent that you start to define yourself through traditional measures of success, to the extent that that's your source of self-esteem, you're destined to be unhappy because you cannot control it. Jack Canfield, another one of my thought leaders that I admire, says, the greatest wound we've all experienced is somehow being rejected for being our authentic self. And as a result of that, we then try to be what we're not to get approval, love, protection, safety, money, whatever that is. And the real need for all of us really is to reconnect with the essence of who we really are, reown all the disowned parts of ourselves, whether it's our emotions, our spirituality, whatever. We all go around hiding parts of ourselves. He says he was with a Buddhist teacher a number of years ago, and that teacher said, here's the secret. If you were to meditate for 20 years, this is where you'd finally get to. Just be yourself, but be all of you. So I've made a living, not a living, but a real life from being true to myself, using the energy of my personality to actually serve the purpose of my soul. And that purpose I'm here to tell you gets revealed to you daily. It is not just one thing. It is the thread that is connecting the dots of everything that you do. So when I first started television at 19, as I said, I was just happy to have a job. But later, through experience, trial, error, some failures, recognized that my true purpose was to be an inspiration and a force for good to allow people to see the best of themselves through the work and the stories that we were able to tell. And so that becomes my legacy. I remember when I finished the school and I had gone to my mentor friend, Maya Angelou's house. Maya was making biscuits and she was teaching me how to make the biscuits. And I said, Maya, I'm so sorry you weren't there for the opening of the school. She said, oh babe, 
I know it must have been beautiful. I said, yes, that school is going to be my greatest legacy. And she said, you have no idea what your legacy will be. I said, oh, no, no, Maya, the school, that's it, the school. Those girls, that's going to be my le legacy. And she said, as she put down the doll, you have no idea what your legacy will be. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, because your legacy is every life that you touch. And that I repeat everywhere because it's true. It's not one thing, it's everything. And the most important thing is how you touch other people's lives. Every day you're carving out the path, even when it looks like you're not. All your actions are creating equal and opposite reactions, which is the third law of motion in physics. What you put out is coming back. How you think and what you do is already being done unto you. That is my religion. I live by that. This whole idea of quantum physics, physics, Newton's law, nature, the way, the order of things, and how life and nature itself operates. And I could see a reflection of my own self, my own being in all of that. And reading Newton's law, third law of motion, which says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, was like a religious experience for me. I just understand I me, mean, all my bells and whistles and lights and dancing emojis went off because I could see that. I'd experienced a little bit of that in The Color Purple, that beautiful line where Whoopi, as Miss Seely says, everything you try to do to me is already done to you. That struck me in particular in the movie. And I understood that everybody's actually saying the same thing. Newton's saying the same thing as Miss Seely is saying the same thing as what we in this country and many other countries call the golden rule, that really what you put out is coming back all the time. And what really struck me is that it's not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It really is when you do, it's already done because that's law. How did you turn your pain into purpose? Well, before the pain became a purpose, it was just an acknowledgement of what had happened to me. And one of the things we talk about in the What Happened to You book is that anything that has happened to you, and I wanted to just make this point to everybody, there's not a black woman in this room who hasn't been through something that helped her build strength, and then something else that helped you build strength, and then something else that helped you build strength. I mean, sometimes you go through so much, you say, God, don't teach me nothing else new today. I don't need no more strength building. But, but this is what I know, is that strength times strength times strength times strength, every time you got stronger, you were building power because strength times strength times strength times strength equals powerful. So we're sitting in a room amongst ourselves with all of these powerful women who have their stories of what happened to you that you can now turn into post-traumatic wisdom. So what I was able to do was to take what had happened to me and to use it as an empathy builder for myself and for other people. And it is my empathy and connection that has allowed me to be the woman that I am today. And so anything that has happened to you, if you are willing to learn from it, to open up and no longer allow the stigma and shame to cause you to hide your secrets, but to know that your vulnerability is where your real strength lies and take that pain and turn it into something meaningful for yourself. And as Maya used to say, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Not even the sexual abuse, the sexual assault. You know, when I was raped, I didn't even know, I didn't even know what a penis was. And like so many other people in this room who were also sexually assaulted when they were young, I didn't tell anybody because I knew it would be turned on me. I knew I was not in a safe environment where other adults would trust my word. And so I kept it to myself until I was on, literally on an Oprah Winfrey show. Somebody shared their story of abuse and I was like, I thought I was the only one. I thought I was the only person 
who had been raped at nine and molested until till I was 14. So I think being able to take your pain and turn it into purpose and power begins first with being able to empathize with other people who've been through the same kind of pain. And everything that's happened to you has also happened for you, if you allow it to be. There's not one thing that has happened to you that you cannot now turn into something that is useful and meaningful in the life that you are now leading forward.